our first speaker, Rakin Patuga. He's a British born Nigerian and he's an educator who has, is presently head of religious education in a secondary school in North London. He has studied the Dean of Islam and many scholars, including Sheikh Bakbaka, Sheikh Mumisa, and presently Imam Sheikh Tijani Sise, to name but a few. He is also a poet and advisor, life coach and spiritual leader. Rakin is also the director of Save Our Boys, an organization set up to support and guide youth who are disaffected, disillusioned and involved in gangs and criminal activity. Rakin was also founder of the world-renowned Islamic rap group Mecca to Medina. MTM were also the founders of a movement of talented individuals who used to perform throughout the UK. All of his lyrics are focused on positivity, spirituality and social issues that he believes needs to be addressed. He has just published his first book, a, a book of poems called Third Eye Open. This book covers both social and religious issues. Rakin is also an arts and culture manager at Rumi's Cave in London, where he organizes events which include lectures on Islam, as well as hosting artistic events. So Rakin will speak now, and he's, but first of all, actually, before he speaks, he's got a wonderful poem called Grenfell, and then we'll move on to his talk, which is my experience with racism. Rakin, when you're ready. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Okay. We can, hear you, we can see you, so start when you're ready, please. Right, excellent. Okay, greetings, everybody. I'm really happy to be here today, really excited. Okay, first of all, I'm going to start with a poem, and um, it's about Grenfell. No birds sang when Grenfell fell. The flowers didn't bloom when Grenfell fell. The sun didn't shine when Grenfell fell. The kids didn't play when Grenfell fell. The moon didn't glow when Grenfell fell. The dogs didn't bark when Grenfell fell. The leaves didn't fall on that dreadful day. Darkness covered the day, dread and dismay. Injustice roamed the earth like a police patrol, bodies badly burnt, powerless, no control. I can't believe such a tragedy appeared. It could have been avoided. It's money they feared, trying to save money on cladding. For the sake of some pounds, they bought highly inflammable padding. Disregarded the rules of health and safety, always cutting costs in the name of austerity, which really means support for the rich. While they filled their pockets, the poor are left in a ditch. Innocent lives stolen away while they slept. Taken in their beds, the angel of death crept. Children screaming, calling out helpless. Onlookers looking on at the scene, helpless. Bodies getting roasted, the fire ferocious. No bird sang when Grenfell fell. The flowers didn't bloom when Grenfell fell. The sun didn't shine when Grenfell fell. The kids didn't play when Grenfell fell. The moon didn't glow when Grenfell fell. The, bar, the dogs didn't bark when Grenfell fell. The leaves didn't fall on that dreadful day. Darkness covered the day, dread and dismay. Nowhere to run, the smoke strong and suffocating. The fire has no friends, fears and frustrating. This could have been avoided, you know, it's just greed. Cutting corners so the fat cats can feed. We need new thinking on the top in Parliament. When calamities strike, we need action, not silence. When calamities strike, we need love and compassion. Let's all come together. Love is the medication. How many people died? We still don't know. The numbers keep creeping like a lynx in the snow. The streets are filled with posters of loved ones that are missing, while every hour and minutes, the hope is dwindling. I hope we can learn some life lessons, work for unity, avoid fear and depression, respect every life, they're all good and precious. Equality for all, not just for the rich and famous. Think about the people, not the penny. Don't think about the few. Focus on the many. No birds fell when Grenfell fell. The, fl the flowers didn't bloom when Grenfell fell. The sun didn't shine when Grenfell fell. The kids didn't play when Grenfell fell. The moon didn't glow when Grenfell fell. The dogs didn't bark when Grenfell fell. The leaves didn't fall on that dreadful day. Darkness covered the day, dread and dismay. Right, so that's my poem on Grenfell. Um, I enjoyed that. And now I'm going to uh, 
Right, trying to get, get my presentation up. I can do this. Right. And uh, what I need from you guys, just to let me know that you'll be able to see. Right. Can you see my presentation? Someone let me know. Can you see that? Yep, we can see it. Brilliant. Okay, here we go. Bismillah. So, right, my experience in racism. So, I've, yeah, I just did my poem on Grenfell. So, uh, so, to stop racism, we need to become anti-racist as a society. This means challenging the way we think and act and being prepared to challenge others to do the same. Now, this is really important because, for example, this is the beginning of my talk, but it's actually the end as well. Okay, and that is that we need to become anti-racist. We're actually living in a new day now. I, I call this day, uh, I've given it my own to that, it's the new enlightenment. Okay, so um, we've, we've been dealing with racism, uh, you know, for the last four, 400 years, since slavery, we've been dealing with racism. But this is a new day and it's really, um, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting. It's given us new chances to um, uh, reflect on how we deal with uh, racism, how we deal with white supremacy, how we deal with the structures that keep it in place and how we challenge that. Okay, and one of the issues is the idea of becoming anti-racist. The idea that we, it's not good enough just to say, um, you know, I've got white friends. I've got black friends, you know, I can't be racist. Yeah, it's not good enough. Or, you know, I've, I've read the latest, you know, like, you know, books. I've got Malcolm X's book. I've got, you know, I've just finished a car. It's not good enough. There needs to be practice done. But we're going to come back to that, actually. And that's, as I said, this is my beginning and my end. So we need to, um, the aim is to become anti-racist. Um, here's a quote here. When I woke up this morning, one of the things that was on my mind and something that has been on my mind for about the past month is the idea that we are experiencing the pandemic within a pandemic. I love that. The dual ills of coronavirus and systemic racism, both of which must be confronted with a new normal that really says what we've been saying in coronavirus. We're all in this together. It remains to be seen whatever that's going to be true as a country is confronted with the systemic racism, yet another inequality in America that has been exposed is in the midst of this coronavirus crisis. Now, you know, racism is not just in America, it's all, all over the world and, you know, uh, but what is important is that with the death of George Floyd, it started uh, a movement, okay, that, um, uh, that picked up all around the world. And the interesting thing is you can, have, you can actually look at this as like um, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. So all of us, people of color, have all been dealing with racism, okay, but some, you know, uh, never talk about it. Some try to forget about it. Well, even though you might see it every day, okay, it, it, uh, you, you experience it through the microaggressions, you know, every day, but you pretend that it's not going on and you, and you kind of put it to bed. And especially in the UK, a lot of the black people have actually put it to bed. We only see it really coming out when you see like, uh, you know, the, the working class, um, you know, uh, march or riots where you actually see this when there's a tipping point. Other than that, we, you know, we don't really have that, you know, uh, this discussion around race. But this George Floyd has created this new environment, which I call, you know, the new enlightenment, where, you know, we're able to discuss and look at race and also have these difficult discussions. Because for things to get better, there has to be difficult discussions going on or else, you know, nothing will improve. Um, protester watches police in riot game walk down. So this is, you know, in, in America. And of course, you know, um, uh, we don't, well, we have got police, some police with guns, but not all of them. But this is just um, a lovely picture that I saw 
which sort of is, is talk, it shows a great picture of what is actually happening, you know, right now in the world, and especially in America where um, uh, black boys, uh, black men have been killed and hardly any police officers have, have gone to jail for that. We have the same uh, issue in the UK where the police officer hasn't gone to jail for killing a black person and many black people have been killed and not one police officer has gone to, to jail for that, which, you know, says a lot. So let's look at the idea of what racism is. So the term racism is often poorly understood. The Oxford Dictionary defines it as prejudice, discrimination, antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on beliefs that one race is superior. However, this is very simplified. The concept within the definition such as discrimination and racial superiority are not always straightforward views on these concepts are often fluid changing over time with new social context and new ways of thinking and definitely what we're in now uh, the racism has definitely changed for example when i because I, I, i'm a british african or i'm a british black person I, I'm, I'm born and bred in the uk my parents came to this country in the 60s um, so I grew up here, okay, so I'm British, I'm, I'm a uh, black British or African British, whatever, so many terms. Um, but my experience of racism in the 70s, okay, was, and this is quite interesting actually, because when I, even when I talk to young black uh, people, male and female, in, under the age of about, say, uh, 25 and under, they, they're shocked when I explain to them the reality of how bad or how in your face racism was and how physical it was in those days. How you know it, it was, they, they, they can't believe it was like that here. So when I grew up, I was saying here, you know, I was chased by skinheads like um, it, was a, it was a natural thing. Luckily, me and my brother, luckily, we, we were fast runners. So we used to run a lot from them, okay? It's only until I got to, you know, get together with a group of, 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 of black boys and just be able to walk around together. In numbers, we were safe. So skinheads would never, you know, attack you in numbers and try to get you on your own. But yes, this is um, uh, the kind of violence we grew up with where skinheads would, you know, would fight you, beat you up, try to beat you up wherever they find you. The graffiti that was around those days was National Front, which was, you know, uh, the, the racist movement those days. Now we have many uh, offshoots of that in this country. Um, the, the sort of graffiti we had was Black South, We Hate Nigs, was, was all splashed everywhere. The Nazi sign was everywhere. This is kind of, you know, how I grew up. So racism was rife and it was in your face, okay? The only the thing about that, uh, you, you knew who the enemy was. They would, the, the racist, those, they, wouldn't, they would not come and smile at you and say, oh, how are you doing? Yeah, you knew who they were. They were blatant, okay? Today it's changed a lot, and now what we're seeing is more institutional racism. So it's not in your face, but it's still much here. So the concept of racial groups from certain anthropological theories so we know that, interesting enough, all of these sorts of racist views that they had of the past where they said that the, um, the black um, uh, person was, you know, three quarters human and one quarter beast and the, the black brain was smaller, you know, than the white brain and uh, we were uncivilized. And all of these kind of, you know, arguments that the, 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 the racist historians of the time were writing about all been disproved even like it, there's a lovely slogan that i like which says um our history our history didn't start with slavery okay slavery came to interrupt our history and we know we had great civilizations for example the first university um uh, you had in the place timbuktu um we had more than 20,000 students who were going there, had amazing manuscripts. And this was, you know, how many hundreds of years before the Oxford and Cambridge, okay? And this was in Africa. 
before in the, di the dictionary, it used to say Timbuktu was a place in the middle of nowhere. But actually, it, it was a place of great learning. And we had great civilizations, the Ghana civilizations, Shanghai. Um, there is so much civilizations that we had that now has all come to light. So we, re so we, know, we now know that all, all of this has been disproved about, you know, you know um, that, that those, the, the racist historians of those times were saying when they came to Africa, they found um, savages. We know all this has been disproved now. But even though these ideas have been disproved, some of the behavior, okay, against um, uh, black people, people of color, is still there. It's still there. Okay? So these, these theories were influenced by colonialism, imperialism, and the desire to show that non-white groups were inferior in order to justify the actions of Western nations. So it's still there today. So you, you have the idea uh, where, like, sometimes, you know, for, to give you an example where um, they, they, uh, they like to talk about um, us in a kind of, uh, in a physical way. Like, for example, the way how S S S Serena Williams, who is the best sports person that we've seen in the last 20 years, who's absolutely phenomenal, but the amount of racism that she's got, oh, she looks like a man, oh, she's, she's grunting, making too much noises, or, you know, she's too powerful. I'm, I'm, uh, she's, the, the amount of racism is just, it's just so much, right? When, you know, it, 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 you can see it so clearly now, in this new day, you can look and see, and, and all of those reporters that say this, when you talk to them about it, they say, oh, no, no, we, we're not racist, we're just, you know, our view, which is an extremely racist view, extremely, okay? Serena Williams is just a brilliant, you know, um, brilliant sports person, and that's it. We don't need all of that, you know, those microaggressions that, that we always get. Um, the current use of terms race and racial developed because these false notions of racial difference have become embedded in the beliefs and behaviors of society, especially in Western nations. These notions influence all areas of life in Scotland and the whole of UK in some degrees, from social attitudes to the way organizations are run, making inequalities for black and minority ethnic groups continue over generations. This is known as structural racism. It can be seen on a personal level in people's attitudes and behavior. That's what I'm talking about. Um, on a social level in how people talk to each other and make decisions, and on an institutional level and how organizations conduct their conduct their business. So race is strongly linked to white populations across the the world. We're not racialized in the same way. For example, even this idea, like for me personally, even this idea of Bain. I have so much, I have so much problems with BAME. Because what does BAME mean? It just means everybody that's not white. Okay? And BAME is not useful. It's not a useful term because it doesn't deal with the nuances of the different communities that, that you're calling BAME. So, for example, um, even just take uh, uh, the, the black population and the Indian, a totally, the Indian experience is totally different from the black. The Indian experience is totally different from the Pakistani experience, is totally different from the Bengali experience, okay? And also in the black community, they, you will nev you'll never be able to get a, like a clear analysis of any kind of work clogging the blacks together because the Nigerians, the Nigerian experience is totally different from the Jamaican experience, okay? The Jamaican experience is totally different from newer, uh, black communities like the Somali community or the or the Congolese community, okay, and all, they're totally different and their needs are totally different, okay. So clogging everybody together with this term "babe" it, it, it doesn't do any good. It's actually useless, and it's and it's just there to say, okay, uh, we are the whites, and this is the rest of you, okay, which is really not useful. Uh, include inequality faced by white ethnic minorities. Yes, there, there, there are some, there are some uh, ethnic minorities, white ethnic minorities that do 
suffer, not from racism, but from prejudice, like for example, the Polish is a good example of that. Okay, so uh, why does racism exist? As I said, you know, it, it, it was used to actually be able to like dominate, rule over people, um, uh, you know, uh, the 400 years of slavery and that, uh, that we went through. Again, okay, all of this was used, for example, you had, you had uh, priests saying that it was okay to enslave Africans, that it was fine because they're not 100% humans, okay? All of this was, you know, you know, was documented, okay? So racism and saying that there's a real difference between the races um, had a real political reasons for happening, okay? Although people in the UK often know little, and this is very important as well. For example, in the UK, um, the majority of um, white people have no real idea about what happened, okay, um, uh, during slavery. They have no idea how they became this powerful white race because even the, 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 real, the true reality of slavery is not even taught, okay. The wealth that was made Okay, which we can still see, you know, in the uh, in, in the wealth of this country, is not really explained. Okay, and so and a lot of the evil that is done is kind of been sweeped under uh, under the carpet. So we just learn a very like a, a nice kind of slavery. Oh, you know, there was slavery, but you know, we we came and we we are the ones who um, stopped slavery. But actually, you were involved in it for hundreds of years and made billions of pounds from it okay, and this is not taught you know which needs to be spoken about and we need to actually revise the curriculum to actually you know teach the reality of what actually happened and also um okay why black people feel bad to talk about racism now this is interesting because as i was saying to you that you what you will find in the black community you will find people that uh feel shy to talk about racism or um, they might be in the workplace, whether they're the only black person, and they don't want to be uh, uh, thought of as a problem, uh, as a bully, uh, as aggressive, as violent, right? So because of all of these kind of issues, uh, usually a black person will just fit in, will just fit in and just try to, you know, do uh, uh, the work that they're meant to do and not, you know, rustle anyone's feathers and get out of there. Yeah, and they hardly ever, to be a black person and to work in this country, you get used to holding your tongue. Yeah, you get used to holding your tongue a lot so you don't actually say, okay, what you feel. And a lot of times when you see injustice has been done, you, you, uh, you keep quiet because you've seen that when the black person does try to stand up for their rights, they're, 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 they're seen as aggressive, they're seen as violent, they're seen as troublemakers. Okay, and this is kind of what you're getting from here. The white all white ideology however doesn't only affect white majority ethnic groups whiteness is not just about skin color non-white groups can also be influenced by white ideology reflecting it in their own attitudes and behaviors in order to benefit and this is um there's a great book absolutely um phenomenal book by um leila sad me and white supremacy which i think anyone who is really serious about becoming anti-racist, you should get this book, okay? Me and White Supremacy by Leila Sad, amazing. And in this book, she kind of goes through um, how, as a white person, well, you know, you benefit, even if you don't understand how. She breaks it down, how your life is made easy just by being white, okay? And how, uh, you know, it's very easy for you to discriminate against you, you know, uh, people of color without you even knowing. So it's important that all of us together, we start to, you know, like understand uh, the benefits we have. And also, you know, um, people of color. Sometimes you'll find, you know, people of color uh, benefit from being um, uh, uh, like white looking. So sometimes you're a mixed race, but you look closer to being white. You can actually pass, and many do. And then, um, when you find out, when you talk to people that pass, and you find out why do they do it, well, they're like, well, actually, when I pass as white, I actually get more um, benefits. There's lots of benefits of passing as white, because you're nearer to 
what um, they call the, the, the status quo, the status quo, um, the top of the white supremacy. So non-white groups can also be influenced. Uh, this would include, for instance, people being afraid to talk about racism for fear of offending their white friends. Those who speak out are often judged to have gone against the norm, the white ideology, view that racism is uncommon and mostly about personal prejudice. Disrupting that view makes people who subscribe to it uncomfortable. Black and minority ethnic people, therefore, often put their white friends' feelings or sensitivity about race above their own needs to address the racism they face. And the idea of this is was, was quite interesting, that there's many uh, white people that have actually said, after the whole George Floyd killing and the, you know, the, 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 the new um, enlightenment, you know, the, the, this um, racism movement, anti-racism movement, lots of white people have spoken to their black colleagues and said, you know, do you feel like this? And then they've, they've been shocked at what has come out. They've been absolutely shocked. They're not realizing that, you know, the life of a black person it, it, living um, uh, in a white world is, is, a, is a very challenging one. Uh, at the most basic level, racism still exists in the UK because white people are viewed as normal in comparison to other diverse communities. Um, someone doesn't have to feel hostile towards people from a minority ethnic group in order to have racist attitudes or to act in a racist way. The fact that black and minority ethnic people are constantly treated as being different, even if several generations of their family have been born in the UK means that they face racism to some degree through their lives. And uh, some of the, the, the ideas that the, uh, the, when we're looking at um, racism and we're thinking about racism, we can look at, for example, uh, the high rates of stop and search. There's a good example here. Um, also, the high rate of uh, black and ethnics going to a prison, so the high rate of the prison population. Also, the high, right, the high rate of um, black and especially uh, Jamaican, uh, Caribbean and mixed race uh, children, uh, boys especially, high rate of exclusion from schools. And also what has been highlighted recently is the higher rate of death through pregnancy. And as many, I think a black woman is four times more likely to, be, to die through pregnancy than her, her white counterpart. Okay, another idea of institutional racism, all of us, well, those who are old enough will remember the terrible death of Stephen Lawrence. And when Stephen Lawrence died, um, it was, uh, uh, what came out of that was understanding that institutional racism was rife in the police force, but not only in the police force, in many other inst government institutions, okay? And that came out of uh, the MacPherson report which explained about institutional racism and how it worked and how the police officers, um, they really messed up the case of Stephen Lawrence. That's why it, it took the family maybe about 15 years to get some justice. Even, and the, the, the saddest thing, if you read into that case, you'll find out that as soon as uh, Stephen was killed at a bus stop by these racist thugs, okay, people went to the police straight away and said, we know who did this, this is, you know, this group of racist thugs who were known in the area to do all of the criminality and the police did nothing with it, okay? So, um, but that is a clear example of um, uh, white privilege, institutional racism. But interesting enough, that was, you know, 20 odd years ago, but we have a similar case today, uh, which happened uh, last year, of, of a Somali girl, Shukri Abdi. It's a present day example, a young Somali refugee who was bullied in school. She just came to this country she, from, from Kenya. She was bullied in school. And then finally she was murdered by school children who, uh, who uh, forced her to get into the water. She couldn't swim and, um, and she drowned. And it said that when she was drowning, you know, one of the children, you know, was just laughing, laughing, you know, watching her drown, okay? And this is something that, um, that happened re recently. There was a massive march um, a few weeks ago 
uh, for Shukri Abdi, but no one so far has been convicted. No one has, has, uh, uh, has been convicted as, as the murderer. So this case is still open now. And again, it's a case of when it's, you know, you can see that a, a black body is not on the same level or respected the same as a white body. And until we have that kind of equality, okay, we, we will still have racism. Now, I'm not, I know, uh, I'm not sure how long I've got left, but um, okay, I'm not a racist, so why should anti-racism matter to me? As I said at the beginning, very few people could be fairly described as racist, but anyone can behave or think in a racist, xenophobic way, as a previously explained structural racism is deeply ingrained in our society. The result of this is that minority ethnic people, especially those who are more visibly multi-ethnic, experience everyday racism. This has a big impact on their lives. It pervades all areas of life and is hard to challenge, so in some ways it can have a bigger impact than obvious forms of racism. And uh, we talk about structural racism. So to stop racism, we need to become anti-racist as a society. This means changing the way that we think and act and being prepared to challenge others who do the same. So basically, if you see um, it's happening, because there's one form that um, Leila Sad talks about, which is, um, which is the white silence. And white silence is the kind of idea that when you see injustice, so for example, in the workplace, and you see somebody being treated, you know, badly, okay, and, and you know it's racist, don't, don't uh, stand around and let it happen. Okay, that is white silence. Okay, and there's, there's all lots of different forms of um, uh, racism where, where maybe we're not the one doing it, but we're allowing it to happen because it, because it doesn't really impact on us. It doesn't really bother us. Okay. Um, Leila said, on, um, we'll end with um, a quote from her. So that rush of an apathy returning is why I have mixed feelings about it. Um, it's easy to buy a book. And it's easy to say black lives matter. And it's easy to say I'm going to try to do the work. It's an entirely different thing to do it. And to do it when the hype is over, meaning, for example, when all of this, you know, uh, the COVID and, uh, and all the anti-racist movement, when it dies down, this is when we're going to really see, are we still going to carry on doing the work? Or we're going to go to back to sleep and carry on just living in this, you know, this, this white, supremacy, white systemic society. Okay. Um, and to do it when the hype is over. The new cycle has moved on and you're not getting rewarded for being so brave for saying Black Lives Matter. Now, you're just having to do the nitty gritty work. That's where the real work is. So basically, for us to become anti-racist, it's really about us educating ourselves and actually, you know, working, making, taking those steps for making a society a better society for all of us. Okay, and I'll end here with just, here are just a few books, okay, uh, some great books on racism, okay, that all of you, I think all of you should read all of these, these are great. And um, when I'm no longer talking about race, Rennie and the Lodge Natives by Carla, Me and White Supremacy, Leila Saad, uh, White Fragility, Professor Robin D'Angelo, that's an excellent book, and Black and British, David Olusoga and British Afwa Hirsch. So um, thank you very much for listening and I hope that you've taken some benefit from there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rakin. It's wonderful to have you. That was Rakin Fatuga talking my, on my experience of racism.